Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our first um, BASF lecture in the new calendar year. It is a particular pleasure for me to uh, welcome Professor Matthew Potter um, as our speaker tonight. Uh, Professor Potter holds a chair in art and design history at the Northumbria University in Newcastle. And when I say it is a particular pleasure uh, that uh, he has joined us tonight, then I say this because we have uh, invited uh, the author of um, one seminal achievement in the more recent scholarship on Anglo-German cultural relations, namely his book, his study, The Inspirational Genius of Germany, British Art and Germanism, 1850 to 1939, published in 2012. But um, he has uh, since uh, published another uh, major study on representing the past in the art of the long 19th century, with the subtitle Historicism, Postmodernism and Internationalism 2022. He has worked on, for example, the uh, painter Louis Corinth and um, the uh, function of art in the Kaiserreich. And he has also, uh, and I mention this particularly because I thought it was a, a rather a remarkable and important discovery, he worked on the uh, lectures, the London lectures that Kenneth Clark uh, gave on German uh, art historians. So um, we are immensely looking forward to your talk, um, Professor Potter, on German Renaissance art and the British historical imagination, research and representations from the 19th century. Over to you. Thank you, Ludiger. That's very kind. I, I wanted to speak to people today uh, on a subject which brings together some of those recent themes uh, that Rüdiger was uh, referring to in, in terms of my book publications. Um, the last edited collection that I was working on brings together this idea of the historical imagination um, that Herbert Butterfield coined originally um, and has been a major component in postmodern uh, interpretations of history in art through the discourses that have evolved since the 1980s mainly. And to bring that together with the work I've previously done in relation to um, Germanism in, in Britain. So Germanism is, as a term I'm, I'm sure most people are aware of, but just to quickly define it, it means anyone who's taken an interest in German culture, uh, in German science, um, in German politics, and um, using that as the material to create a public discourse um, or public practice or public engaging practice uh, within their disciplines. For today, um, I want to focus specifically on two iconic artists for the 19th century in Germany, namely uh, Albrecht Dürer and Hans Holbein the Younger, because of their position within the debates uh, internally within Germany for notions of ident cultural identity and Germanness in the world of art. But stepping back from that kind of forum uh, of the domestic sphere and thinking about how this also relates to internationalist debates and discussions by, by trying to capture what the British public and British artists and British historians were doing in relation to this art history of Germany and how they used that to relate to their own interests at the time. So that's what I'm going to be saying uh, in my, my talk today to you, that's the, the kind of topics I'm going to be touching upon. Um, it is all about painting, uh, largely, um, and occasionally a few drawings and prints. But I've put Henry Hugh Armstead's Frieze of Parnassus on uh, my opening slide, just to make a reference point to show that the Albert Memorial um, was not just a memorial to Prince Albert, but also to Germanism as well. And I'm going to touch on that in any detail. Um, but I imagine that some people might have some questions about that later on. So I thought I'd preempt that uh, in, in my introductory slide. 
I wanted to, to begin by thinking about uh, the reception of Jura and Holbein in Germany before moving on to Britain. We have to understand their reputations in Germany and how they evolved during the 19th century as well. It's very much a case that uh, the middle class in Germany were attached to um, the images produced by Jura and Holbein. And institutions within Germany also were part of a collective enterprise for curating their reputations in and forms of laughter life through their activities. So the Academy des uh, der Bildende Kunst in Vienna possesses a lock of Dürer's hair. Um, and thinking about how this grows from ideas of national identity, but also artistic identity, a lot of this owes its driver um, to the, the activities of the German Romantics at the very end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. The Sturm und Drang um, of writers like Wilhelm Wackenröder and Ludwig Teich, um, they were exploring ideas of the personality of the artists, encapsulating this idea of romantic uh, power of the individual genius and building upon and developing those ideas that were embedded in at the heart of the German Renaissance, in the heart of humanist thought, uh, which was very much part of the promotion of the individual uh, self-improvement and also speaking to civic uh, service as well. So we're seeing a subtle shift with the intervention of those German romantics, uh, where perhaps the intellectual side falls to the back and allows the genius of the individual to come closer to the foreground. Uh, the artist of deep feeling is something that they very much invest in. And in both Dürer and Holbein, they have good role models to work with. In terms of art historians as well, people like Gustav Wagen um, are promoting Holbein and Dürer in their writings. And later on, um, Jakob Burkhardt, the famous Swiss art historian also um, has a vested interest in bringing Holbein especially to the fore due to his Swiss identity. Now, in addition to thinking about the Germans and the Viennese art historians and the Swiss art historians, we have to recognize that there was a, an internationalist effort pushing forward research on Jura and Holbein. Art history definitely began in German speaking countries um, but it was scholars like Leon de Laborde, whose Le Duc de Bourgogne of 1849 really pushed forward scholarship on Holbein, trying to establish a quintessential style. Um, those kind of activities were then fed back into the German system uh, of iconographic analysis, close uh, autographic study of works in order to secure um, the canon um, and play out in full detail the oeuvre of these artists. But it's part of an international dialogue very much from the beginning. Whoa, ah, sorry. Heavy handed there, sorry. Um, but tying into the equation as well, thinking of the legacy of Napoleonic kind of conquest of, of Germany um, and its battles with Vienna uh, uh, as well, the Austrian Empire, we have to remember the 19th century context of nationalism, nascent nationalism, and the long duration of its evolution as well. So a lot of this art historical debate is happening against the backdrop of political evolution, of democratization, of liberal reforms, or at least the attempts to secure those, until the fruition of a German unified state in 1871, a small Kleindeutsch land as well. But a lot of the work that's going on at that time um, is building on local activities uh, around Nuremberg in the case of Jura, with the creation of the Albrecht Dürer Verein, or the Union of Albert, Albert Dürer, um, uh, which created in 1817. Um, the writing of cantatas to celebrate his fame, um, quasi-religious celebrations happening in festivals on occasions, and a lot of things that are, are more kind of familiar today, um, things like uh, badges, special cakes, 
the Biedermeier kind of furniture decoration that draws on uh, visual stimuli taken from his works, et cetera, et cetera. And these are kind of based in an understanding of Jura representing all that was ideal about German artistic practice, honesty, uh, observation, close observation of detail. And all of that myth-making also kind of uh, ignored some of his Hungarian roots for his family to try and purify and make it clear that he is a Germanic artist and someone who should be the hero of a unified Germany as well. A similar case exists for Holbein as well. Um, he is someone who is very readable to middle-class audiences. They see the individual represented on the page and they identify with that. Uh, their individual identity is part of the reason why they value their contribution to a wider society. But what is different about Holbein to Dürer is his relationship with the Southern Renaissance. And for many people who are writing about German art history, there is a counter movement trying to distinguish it from the Southern Italian Renaissance. And Dürer's kind of indebtedness and connection to Italy is more problematic than Holbein's. Holbein does have a connection with Italy, but it's not as emphatic. What we do know uh, is that Holbein spent time in Britain uh, and therefore there was a consanguinity, a shared link between the cousins uh, of England and Germany, an Anglo-Saxon bond that made him less problematic for many German commentators. This is part and parcel to a uh, development in ideas and thinking that comes out of the Enlightenment and feeds into German Romanticism. And Johann Gottfried von Herder's work, uh, his, especially his ideas upon philosophy and the history of mankind, puts forward this concept of the Volk, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, the idea of the people, a, a kind of spiritual bond, uh, community, culturally connected. And there's something that is determined by not just nationhood, but also conditions of climate and geography. What he described as a, a world constituted by wonderfully separated nationalities, not only by woods and mountains, seas and deserts, rivers and climates, but more particularly by languages, inclinations and characters. So the cultural driver for Herder is what defines the, the nation itself. So the art historians are looking to slot Jura and Holbein into this kind of framework. And where the literary cult uh, that develops around Romanticism and Nationalism draws on uh, Renaissance humanist texts and medieval um, motifs and poets, the artists are doing the same when they're looking to their inspirational German old masters. Having set a very brief overview of what's going on in Germany at this time, I want to introduce uh, the, the, the British side of the equation. Um, as I've briefly uh, referred to already, Jura uh, and Holbein had different relationships with, with Britain. Jura it was wholly disconnected from Britain and only through his artworks does he have a, a long history or afterlife that connects with Britain. And partly because of his um, great graphic art output, uh, the ease of transferring prints, um, a lot of that work does get into Britain and into major collections like the, the British Library, but um, the British Museum, sorry. Um, and the Royal Collection at Windsor. In contrast, Holbein, who actually was in residence in Britain at Henry VIII's court between 1526 and 28 initially, and then again in 1532 to 43, dying in Britain, um, that kind of feature to his biography meant that he was crucial for art historians who wanted to claim him as the first great British artist. Uh, for a country that didn't really have a tradition of art history uh, into the Renaissance period. I want to refer to a few theoretical texts that have been produced, put this into kind of context, and this goes beyond the 19th century. 
back to the 18th. Jonathan Richardson, uh, who wrote theory on painting, did note Holbein, but only marginally in a catalog of artists who had been practicing in Britain. Joshua Reynolds didn't feature him at all. And it was only in introductions to later versions of his discourses when they were published, did others add Holbein uh, and Dürer into the mix more greatly. Dürer does get a mention in the sixth discourse, but uh, it's rather dismissive, uh, saying that he's inferior to the Italian tradition, following Vasari's judgment, Giorgio Vasari, the great art historian of the Italian Renaissance and Italian Renaissance artist himself. But Reynolds did say that there was a rich mass of genuine materials provided by artists like Dürer for students to learn from. So he wasn't completely thrown out of the equation by the first president of the Royal Academy. It was the 19th century historians though, Richard and Samuel Redgrave, the brothers, who uh, were responsible for putting together the first modern history of British art. And they gave Holbein a clearer principal position in the first chapter of their text. They believed his residences at the Tudor court were crucial for having an immediate and lasting effect upon the art of our country, as they said. Despite the fact that he didn't leave any followers or a school, um, it was a lasting impression that he made. There is an interesting coincidence between um, their view of Holbein and his input to British art and what Herder had declared over 80 years earlier in relation to cultural kind of transfer between Germany and England. He said, compare England with Germany. The English are Germans. And even in the latest times, the Germans have led the way for the English in the greatest things. He doesn't mention Holbein, but Holbein would have been a great example to fit into that equation. I've mentioned the woodcuts that Jura um, had circulating around Britain uh, and in private collections. The technology of 19th century illustration meant that this could ramp up in uh, volume, but also uh, in reach to get into the homes of middle class owners, not just into the private collections of those with money, the wealthy. At the same time, middle class drivers on education meant that scholarship on Jura was being increased uh, exponentially over the 19th century. Doing a quick overview of publications in Jura that appeared uh, in Britain at the time, you can see that most of them are reproductions of wood engravings. There are lots of essays that appear in journals that are reproduced as pamphlets uh, and appear in books. Also exhibition catalogues, biographies, and also reviews of German biographies and German art historical publications. So there was a steady flow that we're aware of. Thinking about the art establishment in Britain, I've mentioned Reynolds already, but another Royal Academician, um, Henry Fuseli, served as professor of painting at the Royal Academy uh, from 1799 to 1805 and again, from 1810 to 1825, and he delivered some lectures on painting um, to the Royal Academy students. And he had some interesting things to say about Dürer and Holbein. Albert, Albert Dürer was, in my opinion, he writes, a man of great ingenuity without being a genius. He studied, but he did not invent a style. That he copied rather than selected the forms that surrounded him and sans remorse, tact, deformity and meagerness to fullness and sometimes to beauty, led Fuseli to downgrade him in terms of his genius. He doubted the claims that had been made by other art historians for Jura that he was the father of the German school, for he neither reared scholars, Fuseli writes, nor was he imitated by the German artists of his or the succeeding century. So a little bit like Holbein in Britain, Jura did not leave any students to carry on the task that he'd started. What's interesting is that Fuseli's judgment of Holbein was different. Holbein was, for Fuseli, the scrupulous precision, the high finish and the Titianesque colour that he produced meant that he was a master of invention, 
who exhibited, quote, a style of design equally poised between the emaciated dryness of Albert Durer and the bloated corpulence of Goltzius. I think maybe, due to his own nationality, he was a Zurich-born Swiss uh, artist who moved to Britain, like Holbein. That may, that fact may explain his preference for Holbein over Durer, um, because those conversations of German Romanticism and the switch from Dürer to Holbein hadn't really fully occurred back in Germany. Moving on, um, there are a few key biographies that were produced in the 19th century, but some of those were um, translations of and summaries of German texts. Others were whole, wholly new independent studies. And I want to name a couple here. Both uh, appeared in 1870. Um, or rather in the years 1869 to 1870. One of them was Mary Margaret Heaton's uh, biography of Jura, and the other one was William Bell Scott's uh, biography. And a review in the portfolio of that year praised the former as a perfect adornment for a drawing room due to its beautiful illustrations and its binding, um, but stated that the, the latter, Scott's biography, was a proper prop for students. It provided the scholarship that they would acquire to understand Dura better. In conclusion, that reviewer in the portfolio said that indeed there appears to be little danger that Dura's fame will ever diminish in this country, or that we shall ever be behind other nations in hearty and intelligent admiration of his most noble and original genius. Whatever was going on, it's clear that it was a constant interest in Dura. In British, amongst British authors, but also British audiences. These uh, editions of his literary uh, remnants were produced in multiple uh, occasions, reprinted, re-edited uh, by different authors ad infinitum, all the way through the 19th century. People kept on buying them, that's the important thing. Now, what's interesting is that Dürer, despite all of that scholarly and um, reading public interest in Dürer's life and works, Holbein's portraits seem to catch the imagination uh, of British audiences much more effectively. Part of the growing uh, interest in historical genre painting, where people read historical texts, novels, but also academic books, and are interested in seeing anecdotes that aren't perhaps necessarily written out in full detail in those texts, imagined by artists on the canvas surface and put on display in art galleries. With Holbein, the reason why he is also especially interesting to British audiences is because of his depiction of famous British historical figures, people like Thomas More um, uh, and Henry VIII, for example. So it's historical painters who use this to engage an audience who are interested in historical subjects, not necessarily to be lectured at, but to be entertained and amused. Thinking about art criticism at the time, I know I've had this portrait of F.D. Morris up for a long time, the uh, Christian socialist. Uh, the reason I put that up there is because it was the subject of review by that famous uh, art critic, John Ruskin. In 1859, he wrote that portraiture may be divided into three great schools. The greatest is the Venetian, headed by Titian, and entirely right. On one side of it is the German school, headed by Holbein, erring slightly on the side of intenseness and force of definition. On the other side of it, the English school, headed by Sir Joshua Reynolds, erring slightly on the side of facility and grace of abstraction. Now, the Venetians and Sir Joshua are, for the present, only inimitable. But Holbein is imitable and is the best model for us. So Ruskin felt that Holbein had the kind of values in portraiture that modern artists, modern British artists, could cultivate and did cultivate. And he saw Dickinson's portrait of Morris as an example of that fact. Now, of course, this is a charcoal drawing but it was displayed at the Royal Academy and it was providing that kind of portrait accuracy and realism that Ruskin felt 
obvious in the works of Holbein and something that could be used to perpetuate and further his own views about modern art uh, that he advocated in the case of Turner, for example. Just as Holbein had had his reputation advanced by Laborde in France in 1849, the next, arguably one of the biggest contributions to uh, scholarship on Holbein came from a British expert. Alfred Waltman in Germany had produced a biography of Holbein in 1866. Um, in that, uh, a lot of hard spade work had been done um, that had helped help to, to kind of dismiss a lot of errors that have grown in the art historical canon around the artist. But there was a, still a debate about the quintessential style of, Hol of Holbein. Uh, and also there was a long-standing argument over the Maya Madonna um, and the version of that that existed in the Dresden um, gallery, the Zwinger, and the Darmstadt version of that as well. And no one had actually defini definitively resolved that argument. And it fell to the British historian, uh, Vornham, Ralph Nicholson Vornham, who was the keeper of the National Gallery to use German techniques of art historical analysis to compare the two works. He undertook research in Germany, he looked at both works, and he pushed forward an idea that the Darmstadt version was the original and the Zwinger version was the copy, arguing that it was commonplace for original works sometimes to leave the home of the original patron to go with an elder son to a new location and a copy would be commissioned and stay in the original location and a confusion would then emerge about which one came first, which was the chicken, which was the egg. Vornham's work um, was given a, a forum to be tested in 1871 when the Darmstadt and Dresden versions were put on display as part of a Holbein um, com a conference. And in Dresden, other German scholars were able to, to see how Vornham had used Gottfried Semper's theory of style analysis to prove which one came first. Now, it wasn't just Vornham in isolation. John Ruskin wrote again and again about Holbein and Jura uh, and was instrumental in making sure that Holbein would remain in the foreground with the focus strongly put upon him. Later, he wrote uh, about how the greatest master of German or any Northern school was Holbein. Um, and he did this by comparing Holbein and Dürer's portraits of Erasmus. He said that affectionate self-forgetfulness protects Holbein from the chief calamity of the German temper, vanity, which is at the root of all Jura's weakness. This is a lecture he gave to Oxford University. He also perceived that there was a melancholy in Jura's work that did not exist in Holbein, and therefore it probably appealed more strongly to British audiences and their sunnier disposition. He compared the, the image on the left to the image on the right. In Holbein's work, the face leads everything, and the most lovely qualities of the face lead in that. The cloak and cap are perfectly painted. Just because you look at them, neither more nor less than you would have looked at the cloak in reality. He compared Holbein to uh, the styles of other artists, Rembrandt's virtuous painterly touch, for example, or Gainsborough's gracefulness, Leonardo's fantastic chiaroscuro, shading of dark and light, and Titian's masterly composition of paintings. But it was realism that Holbein offered, and Ruskin had a firm belief in the truth to nature philosophy for modern art. He continued, oh, sorry, he continued his assault on Jura and building up of Holbein by writing, you say only 
in looking at these pictures, Erasmus is surely there, and what a pleasant sight. You don't think of Holbein at all. But now, when you look at Dürer's, the very first thing you see, and at a distance, is this great square tablet with the image of Erasmus drawn from the life by Albert Dürer, 1526, and a great straddling AD besides. Then you see a cloak and a table and a pot with flowers in it and a heap of books with all their leaves and all their clasps and all the little bits of leather gummed in to mark the places. And last of all, you see Erasmus's face. And when you do see it, the most of it is wrinkles, all egotism and insanity, this gentleman. Hard words to use, but not too hard to define the faults which rendered so much of Dura's great genius abortive and to this day paralyze among the details of a lifeless and ambitious precision, the student, no less than the artist of German blood. For too many, as an Erasmus, too many a Dura among them, the world is all cloak and clasp instead of face or book, and the first object of their lives is to engrave their initials. Ruskin was not a Germanist. He was a, he had a phobia for German art and for German ideas as well. Um, I cover that a little bit in my book on the inspirational Germany. He preferred theoria instead of aesthetic to describe art theory, art philosophy, because aesthetic came from the German term. It was one of R Ruskin's idiosyncrasies uh, and something that we need to be aware of um, if, uh, and we should probably definitely shouldn't accept him on face value. Um, his arguments do not hold water. But they fit within a, a wider uh, context because when he pitched his book, Modern Painters, on Turner, um, his initial publisher said, why don't you write something on the Nazarenes instead? It would have a better audience. And he took that to heart uh, rather mean-spiritedly um, and tried to persecute German art ever since. Um, now, what's interesting in, in his discussion of Dürer and, and what he sees as the, the errors of German art is the, the lifelessness of it. Um, the over precision of it. These are stereotypes that grow in size over the 19th century and into the beginning of the 20th century as well. The machine like sterile qualities, these kind of watchwords that are um, polemical um, at best. Um, in his, it, essentially, in his kind of further exploration, the fifth lecture. Uh, looks at Dürer's real power. He discusses how he had a scientific quality in his work. He had a great knowledge of anatomy. He knew the proportions of the human body well and had a taste for optics. You know, it all sounds very scientific. But he said that the greater fortune and Adam and Eve engravings uh, counted his principal works rather than the ones that were more popular engravings such as Melancholia, Night and Death, etc for the reasons that they, they kind of move into that realm of anatomy uh, and science and the representation of the human body um, rather than the melancholic work that he didn't like. Ruskin continued in these lectures, Holbein is right, not because he draws more generally, but more truly than Dürer. Dürer draws what he knows is there, but Holbein only what he sees. So there's a higher level of science. He says that Holbein, ignorant Holbein did much more for the story of England under Henry and Elizabeth than Dürer ever contributed. This art kind of differentiation between a literal science, one that just does analysis forensically, and a higher poetical science that enhances your knowledge is in alignment with the arguments he made about Turner and how his grand landscapes were true history paintings. First volume of modern painters argued this in 1843. For Ruskin, Holbein's engravings were equivalent to Botticelli's as well. And he saw that Holbein was a Northern reformer in the, the tradition of, of Martin Luther, which appealed to the Protestant uh, work ethic tradition that Ruskin allied himself with as well. He described Holbein as a civilized boor uh, whereas Botticelli was a reanimate Greek, but they both had the same drive and motivation to re revolutionize artistic practice. And that brought them together as the two greatest artists in engraving. 
Despite all this animosity to German scholarship, Dürer uh, and Holbein scholarship was referred to by Ruskin when he needed it. So in relation to Holbein's noble naturalism, um, he drew on Boltzmann's scholarship to, to back that up, including quotations and footnotes. I want to move on in the next section of my talk to consider artistic interventions. So these are um, the, the artists who were responding to Germanist subjects and Will Vaughan uh, did a great piece of work exploring how German themes um, were prominent between 1800 and 1850, but also uh, in the aftermath of that mid-century uh, changeover um, where his study of German romanticism's impact on British art ends. He, he did a survey of German subjects that were displayed in London exhibitions that went up to 1860. And it's, I just want to quote some of the facts from that because it, it sends a, a strong message about observable patterns. So between 1815 and 1822, uh, the number of ex exhibitions, including paintings, um, work, the number of artworks displayed were in single fingers every year for, for, those, um, for those seven years. For between 1823 and 1835, it moves up between 10 and 19 a year. It's in the 20s for the period between 1836 to 1837, only two years, but then increases between 21 and 56 annually between 1838 and 1860. So there's an upward trajectory that we're seeing uh, in terms of artists displaying works on German subjects. A lot of those are based on literary texts. Um, they, there are numerous works, uh, Solomon Geisner, Goethe's Faust and Sorrows of Werther, uh, Schiller's Robbers and Wallenstein, de la Motte Fouquet's um, writings, Grimm's Tales, German medieval romances. They will offer subjects that the British artists depict, illustrate in works that are shown at the Royal Academy, at the British Institution, etc., etc. They also uh, include historical genre paintings that uh, use important historical figures like Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Martin Luther, Johannes Gothenburg, Joseph Haydn, Ludwig van Beethoven, Frederick the Great, and George Frederick Handel as well. So these are um, subjects that are anecdotal and entertaining, designed for a mass audience, a middle-class audience. Examples of subjects taken from the lives of German artists are in fact though, rarer than these other subjects that I've already discussed. So in the next section, I want to, want to kind of talk about a few of these examples that I've been able to trace. The first of them is William Bell Scott's Albrecht Dürer at Nuremberg. I've referred to him as one of the authors of a biography that appeared in the 1869-1870 period. Um, but his painting of Dürer comes 15 years earlier. It's a, a monumental work. It's a, a breathtaking piece of historical reconstruction. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit more about his family before we, we look at the painting in detail, but his father was an engraver. Um, and in his biography, he refers to uh, how his brother, sorry, his brother, yeah, his brother, who was an interested, he was interested in German romanticism. Um, and his father also, as an artist, he was an engraver, was connected to the tradition then went straight back to Albert Dürer, Albrecht Dürer, sorry. He describes his father as the latest descendant of the mixed trade carried forward by Albert Dürer in the great house still standing near the Tiergarten gate of Nuremberg, which we see depicted in his 1854 painting. Although he did reluctantly admit that my father indeed was not a Dürer, he cared little for painting. So as an engraver, he was only half as um, total uh, an artist as Dürer was. It's intriguing that despite his father's background, Scott decided to depict Dürer holding his paintbrushes. And we can see them there, the broad headed brush and the thinner brush. Uh, and looking out over the cityscape to 
emphasised his engagement with the world as a humanist. There's a letter that Anna Howitt, who was uh, trained in Germany, um, it was enthusiastic about Scott's depiction of Jura. She wrote to him in March of 1854, having seen it on display. Was I not instantly transported in spirits into medieval Nuremberg? Was it not delightful to stand in that queer gallery with Albrecht Dürer himself against his background to Adam and Eve and gaze down with him upon the marketplace all astir with knights and ladies? Oh, it was vastly pleasant. All the gables and towers and rambling old houses did my heart good. They even recalled the warm mouldering smell peculiar to those South German towns and how pleasant and heiter or cheerful, as they would say there. What's that clear blue heaven overhead? Her response was very experiential. Um, she describes in detail uh, the feelings that are evoked uh, of almost being there in person, seeing the landscape that Jura would have seen. And I think that's very much a part of the historical genre tradition and that engagement with the historical imagination that Victorian artists at this time were attempting to, to achieve in their works. What's interesting about the, uh, her, her reference to the Adam and Eve, you can just make, about make out in the, the right hand side in the background in shade, uh, the, the work she's referring to. It doesn't actually relate to any known uh, examples. And I've, I've kind of lightened uh, the cropped detail from Scott's work on the left there, which doesn't do it much favours. But I just wanted you to see that you know, it doesn't actually relate to his Adam and Eve of 1504, just crop that to, to show Eve there. It does have a, a raised hand um, that is a mirror image of the 1507, but they're, they're very much different depictions. You can see how Scott's Eve is turning her head to, the, to see Adam. Um, so that is more like the 1504 one. So he's synthesized it in many ways. It's possible that there was a copy uh, of a Jura, um, Adam and Eve, that has been since reattributed, another version to another artist. Uh, there's reference to a juvenile um, version, but uh, I haven't been able to trace that. And I don't think other scholars have either. Uh, based on on my researches, he does Scott does draw upon art historical sources though for this work. So, like uh, Armstead, he draws on Jura's portrait that's in the Alta Pinakothek in Munich for his depiction of the artist. Um, and he did travel to Nuremberg to research his biography, and I've just shown you here sketches that he used, uh, recreated in the 1869 biography, but these were probably sketches that he made in preparation for the 1854 painting. Um, and we can see that by making comparisons between the illustration and the painting. You can see how that tower on the left-hand side, it's, it's just been twisted slightly, the relationship between the various buildings. But you can see how the first image, the, the drawing as the later engraving, would have informed the composition of the painting on the right hand side. I discussed the iconography of this work in Inspiration of Genius of Germany, so I'm not going to spend any further time thinking about that here, um, but it does speak to that lived experience, you know, the, the eyewitness account that uh, Scott was trying to capture in his painting by the fact that he went to Germany and looked at the landscape uh, in, with his own eyes. Um, to, to kind of make it more believable and more authentic. The other work that I've identified as depicting Jura was by Jay Noble, probably James Noble, but I haven't yet been able to, to firm that up. Not been able to trace this work, but it engages in that anecdotal um, material of a, a moment in the life of the artist, this time associated with another um, celebrity in the form of Martin Luther. I think here uh, it relates to Jean-Henri Merle d'Aubigny's um, history of the Great Reformation. So it's not directly Germanist uh, in, in the first instance. It's more about a relationship with the religious history here, because d'Aubigny was a Swiss Protestant minister as well as a historian of the Reformation. So he's not writing about German history primarily. Um, he's writing about religious history, it just happens to be 
set in a lot of it around Germany um, to prop up his own religious interests. And I think that means that Noble's work fits into that category as well. So it's not the same quality as William Bell Scott as a Germanist intervention. Moving on to depictions of Holbein, there were more of those. And I think that speaks to what we've been hearing about the enthusiasms from Fusely to Ruskin and beyond for Holbein over Dura for the British audience. Um, I think essentially uh, the depiction of John Gilbert of Holbein uh, painting the portrait of Anne Boleyn. Um, it's, it's part of that process of fixing historical genre of painting within a tradition that brings artists into the foreground, that prioritises painting as an important and significant act for the public. So art historians uh, are writing about the history of the artist, but artists who paint other artists, historic artists, are helping to illustrate those art historical uh, arguments in, in kind of painterly form. So there's a kind of an alliance between the art historians and the artists when we see historical genre paintings of artists from the past painting uh, important works of celebrities, politicians, kings, et cetera, et cetera. Gilbert's painting, as I say, is, is one of those uh, that's been un untraced, but it relates to other depictions of historic artists in his oeuvre, and that includes Rubens instructing the younger Teniers from 1858 and the studio of Rembrandt of 1861. That they're both low, Deutsch, low Deutsch artists, neither Deutsch artists, low German artists, is, is kind of significant, but it's not, you know, it doesn't fit within a wider Germanist agenda, I don't think. Uh, Frederick Stevens wrote about this Holbein picture uh, and said that had the great Augsburger performed it himself, Holbein, it would no doubt have been eminently pictorial and fitted for the sumptuous art of John Gilbert. So Stevens thinks that Gilbert did a good job in capturing the spirit of Holbein. Um, it's kind of interesting that if you look at the kind of works that Gilbert's produced, there are no other Germanist subjects. So Holbein perhaps was interesting to Gilbert more due to his Britishness or the, the British elements of his biography. As one obituarist noted of Gilbert, um, that artist, he belonged to a tradition, a generation of artists who, whose English feeling and devotion to English landscape are their chief characteristics. For Sir John Gilbert, England was always the England of St. George, old and merry, fertile mother of stalwart sons, rich soil of golden harvests, with a strong flavor of Robin Hood and the green wood modified except in his finest conceptions by a suggestion of Drury Lane transferred to the canvas. The obituarist also said that Gilbert was the Scot of painting. So that kind of resonance of the historical imaginations continued there. The next work that was uh, falls into this category ex exhibited in 1849 was Air Crow's Holbein drawing, the infant son of Henry VIII and his nurse mother Jack. Sadly, another untraced work, but I think possibly it was a reimagining of um, another art historical source material, uh, Edward VI as a child, um, which was by Holbein. It's possible that Air Crow was using this as a prop um, and helping to imagine what it might have been like when Holbein produced this work, or at least the drawing in preparation for it. Third work in this category was Cowie's Henry VIII and Holbein, which had an appended quotation. I can whenever I please make seven lords of seven plowmen, but I cannot make one Holbein, even of seven lords. That was produced in 1858, upon display in that, in that year. That anecdote refers to a lord approaching Henry VIII and asking for him to punish Holbein because Holbein had rushed out of his studio when that lord had broken well, pushed his way into Holbein's house and run up the stairs, uh, causing Holbein to panic and run out of his studio and knock the Lord down the stairs. So he'd gone to petition for Holbein to be punished. And Henry's response was basically, no way, he's more important than you are. And that original account came from Carol Vermander in 1604. So it has uh, an origin in um, art historical texts, 
but it also was reproduced in numerous anecdotal publications in the 19th century due to its entertaining quality. So again, uh, a little bit of connection there to the popularity of subjects chosen by historical genre paintings, uh, painters for their, for their subjects. Now we do have John Evan Hodgson's Sir Thomas More and his daughters in Holbein's studio from 1861. And here's what it looks like. Uh, I just want to explore some of the connections here because apart from one painting, The Patriot's Wife from 1859, uh, which has a kind of indirect connection to Germany because it depicts the German jailer of a, an Italian freedom fighter of the wars of liberation. So it kind of indirectly connects to nationalism and the drive for a, a German unification one step re removed. But I don't think that's enough to uh, suggest Hodgson's interest in foreign affairs or Germanism even. Tom Taylor, the critic for the time said that in Hodgson's pictures from English history and past life, Mr. Hodgson has never deviated from the lines of honest workmanship, sober color and unaffected earnest conception. He felt that these works were typical of artists of the Sir John's Wood School, which Hodgson belonged to. While Hodgson didn't um, possess the dramatic excesses of his colleague, Philip Homogenes Calderon, he did possess a modest honesty and a conscientiousness pushed to what some might call timidity and tameness. Given Hodgson's role, as the Royal Academy's librarian from 1882 to 95, and professor of painting for the same period, we have to think of him as a scholar as well as an artist. And I want to look at the painting in detail to see how he uses kind of art historical bric-a-brac to decorate and ornament his depiction of Sir Thomas More and his daughters in Holbein's studio. If we look at the the room setting. He takes inspiration from this unknown artist's um, emulation copy of the family of Henry VIII, which is at Hampton Court Palace. You can see how he's picked up the details. That's the elements of um, the column and leather wall cladding um, that are then transposed into uh, Hodgson's painting. He also draws on some of the group compositions uh, of Hans Holbein's work. A lot of these are copies that other artists have made, so he's, he's working second hand, um, but they are true likenesses or true facsimiles of the original works. Um, if, as Vernon says, you know, perhaps uh, by the other hands, they do capture some of the essential qualities of the originals. Um, and within his painting as well, he draws on famous works that are uh, appearing kind of uh, as inspirations for works on the easel um, and on the wall behind as well. So these portraits of Erasmus appear in the background of Sir Thomas More and his daughters. And Holbein's miniature portrait of Margaret Roper, Thomas More's daughter, um, is inspiration for how he depicts her in the composition. And he draws upon Holbein's self-portrait for his depiction of the artist as well. There's one final bit which, talking with some colleagues, um, they helped me to identify a, a lifting of a bottle from the National Gallery um, portrait of Erasmus. This wasn't in the National Gallery at the time, it was in uh, the collection of a, a nobleman um, elsewhere, um, but would have been visible to him via his researches and through uh, engravings uh, at the Royal Academy as well as at the British Museum. So we see this little bottle in the top right hand corner and that appears at the bottom right by the window in Hodgson's imagination of, of what this event might have uh, included. 
So he's drawing on multiple sources and bring them all together to create a synthetic composition. Um, all of this is aimed at creating something that is as authentic and as believable and as convincing for his audience as possible. So when we put all these things together, they create a portfolio of evidences that supports a, an authentic rendition of a, an imagined event. So Wagen, um, this is found the bit where I made a note about this. Gustav Wagen in 1835 went to Longford Castle and saw the Erasmus painting with the glass bottle uh, and wrote about it um, in his, his kind of uh, write up of the tour. So all these things are available to Hodgson and he draws on them to create this wonderful, synthetic, historically real uh, image of the past. I put historically real in square in kind of scare quotes uh, due to the problematic nature of the historical imagination. We're coming to the end of my talk now. So just to give you one more example, Alphonse Le Gros, he produced four years later, a uh, painting of Sir Thomas More showing some of Holbein's pictures to Henry VIII. It's a similar subject to Hodgson's. Um, this one, I've not been able to trace either, but I wanted to spend some time thinking about it because um, it kind of speaks to the popularity of Holbein and his realist credentials because Le Gros was very much invested in realism. As the Slade professor, he advocated artists producing work with a realist style uh, and based on naturalistic study of the human form, etc. And this is the only historical genre painting that he exhibited at the Royal Academy, so it's exceptional. But unlike some of these other artists I've spoken about, I think it also is a clue to his more nuanced and heartfelt belief in the interests of studying German art, essentially his Germanism credentials. Cosmo Monk House in 1882 referred to Le Gros' realist credentials and said that it would be difficult to exhaust the list of those old masters who have truly been masters to him. So despite being a realist, he was interested in art history and historical models. And he cited the influence of ancient Greek sculpture, Michelangelo and Velasquez upon Le Gros, but also, this is crucial, to the Germans, quote, especially Holbein and Albert Dürer, he turned naturally, teachers to whom his grave angel consigned him, speaking of his melancholy, Teachers full of that scorn of delight, which is at once the noblest feature of his art and the greatest obstacle to his popularity. So Le Gros kind of high mindedness, his geist, his spirit, um, his mind was connected as much to Germany as it was to France or Britain. And that made difficulties for him in, in being successful or popular, but it also made his work more interesting for Monkhaus at least. And we see his engagement with Holbein. He created a memory copy of Holbein's Erasmus. This is undated, but it is a trace of his engagement with Holbein. Not just in that, but also in his graphic art as well. This is Le Gros' uh, Death in the Pear Tree from 1877. And for this work, um, Monkhouse thought that it bore a clear sign of the inspiration due to Holbein. Um, the aspirations of a human soul, Monk House continues, towards a life beyond have been the motive is of at least melancholy, the fears of that life of his grimmest imaginings. So all the way through his work is kind of captured by a fear of death, a melancholy that was connecting both to Jura and Holbein. And that's repeated in other art historical and art critical responses to Le Gros' work. So at that point, I want to kind of come to a conclusion. Um, I mean, essentially, my argument today has been about a, a kind of nuanced and steady increasing reception of the art historical accounts of Jura and Holbein through the 19th century, but also artistic engagements with the creation of historical imagination around these two celebrity old masters from Germany and how their relationship with Britain was nuanced so that Holbein overtook Dürer uh, during the course of the 19th century due to the, not only his 
biographical connection to Britain, but also the qualities in his work that spoke to a middle class Anglo-Saxon audience who were interested in the individuality, Protestant work ethic, but also the values of portraiture speaking to their own ambitions and their own drive to be heard as middle class members of a modernizing Britain. Thank you for listening. I think at this point we will draw to a close and open up for questions uh, if, if that suits everyone. Absolutely, but not before we thank you most warmly, uh, Matthew Potter, for this fascinating, uh, truly illuminating talk you have presented us with. Thank I you. think um, it is uh, quite remarkable um, how you manage to, by just focusing on predominantly two uh, artists of the Renaissance, um, how you demonstrate what cultural transfer actually means when it comes to um, one phenomenon, which seems to be at the very center, definitely of the Holbein uh, reception, namely appropriation. I mean, I, I couldn't help thinking that um, what happened in this country to uh, Georg Friedrich Händel somehow happened to uh, Holbein in a, in a very similar, in a very comparable way. Um, so appropriation seems to be the kind of, dare I say it, leitmotif, that um, informs that type of reception and an appropriation that was obviously much more difficult in the case of Dura and you gave us uh, the reasons for it uh, with this one very notable exception that I think also uh, is the cover of your aforementioned book. So ladies and gentlemen questions from you, uh, questions from, I would say, if we were in live in the floor, from the floor. So um, either through the chat, if possible, or you can, of course, raise your hand and uh, Matthew Shaw will um, give you a voice, so to speak. So any questions to um, our speaker, please. Not all at once, as they say. By the way, I need to apologize for the fact that we were unable, despite trying, we were unable to eliminate these, um, shall we say, transliterations at the bottom of the presentation. Um, they gave us um, uh, a not terribly welcome distraction, but I think, Matthew, your talk was so riveting that we were definitely glued to what you had to tell us um, this evening. Right, any- If nobody else has got one, um, could I ask one? I had a, hadn't intended to be a, a panel member, so I, I could, could possibly ask a question if that's all right. Please, please. Um, yeah, Matthew, I wondered, I, I imagine you probably did see the Dura show at the uh, National Gallery last year. And um, I wondered uh, how you thought and whether you thought the reception of Dura had uh, had had changed, and whether he had uh, received um, was 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 now receiving a more um, a more um, sympathetic reception. I, I mean, um, I thought it was an absolutely extraordinary show, and uh, I wondered particularly because. Uh, it reached out into other artists' works. I'm thinking particularly of Jan Gossart, but um, I, 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 I thought, my goodness, uh, when when they showed Leonardo da Vinci at the National Gallery, it was absolutely mobbed, and uh, whereas the Dura show was was relatively fluid. I wondered if you had any thoughts about whether his reception was was has become more sympath sympathetic over the years. That's an interesting question. Yeah, I, I think that. It's true that the receptions of these artists do fluctuate um, time and again, and, and they do respond to the external stimuli of whatever's going on in terms of European politics, um, but also UK domestic politics as well. And I think those those kind of connections, I mean, there was the, the, the Tate Britain show on Holbein as well, gave an opportunity for us to, to mm. see um, Holbein's works in, in a, a more, I say up to date environment, um, but but there's something which I think is problematic about the two for exhibitions in that you know 
for a certain extent for for Jura because of of the prints you have to be quite close up to look at the prints and actually any graphic art um, has to be curated in a way that is problematic for audiences large audiences in a in an exhibition space and when I went to see the the Holbein I I experienced that when you're queuing up behind people and then you feel uh, a little bit selfish if you stay too long in front of miniatures um, or prints. Um, for Dura with larger paintings um, the, and, and for Holbein as well, it's easier in front of those works. So you know, for graphic artists or artists who have a large part of graphic art as part of their, their oeuvre, I think, I think the, the tolerance for modern audiences is perhaps more problematic um, and both artists are, are subject to that uh, for modern exhibitions in Britain. But I think that the Jura's internationalism, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't uh, a nationalist. Um, he was a, a loyal uh, Nuremberg and Franconian, um, but Germany didn't exist at the time. So it would have been a nonsense to try to argue that Jura was, was part of a nationalist ideal. And, and that's true also for Holbein. So um, I think accidentally, you know, Jura's international credentials um, make for a, a good reception amongst internationalists in the British public. Um, you know, I'm not going to mention the context in which that might be relevant, but hopefully, you know, some people see some inspiration um, in, in artist, an artist genius who, who sees beyond national borders. Um, but I mean, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of an evasive <laughs> answer to that. But I think that, you know, compared with exhibitions of the Impressionists that are, are easy to, to negotiate, mm -hmm. both Holbein and Dura are problematic for modern audiences for the reasons I've given, I think. Does that, does that answer your question? That was, a, that was a splendid answer and much food for the thought. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to come back, if I may, to um, uh, the conception of the Renaissance in the 19th century um, and uh, the potential tension between the uh, Renaissance, the interest in the Renaissance on the one hand, and, for example, Ruskin's definition of modernism, what modern actually means. Um, why do you think is there, this is definitely comparable in, in, in our two cultures, in the, in the British and the German culture of the 19th century, this going back to the Renaissance? Uh, it is a phenomenon, is it not? And um, in literature, of course, you, you have this um, um, in Middlemarch. Um, I mean, George Eliot really epitomizes that, but from a purely scholarly point of view, just going back to um, Renaissance sources, source materials, etc. But um, what do you make of this um, peculiar tension between um, the rediscovery, the rediscovery of renaître, of being reborn on the one hand um, in the 19th century, and this desire to move science forward, to um, define modernism for the first time? I mean, Baudelaire is the, is the one that, of course, brings to mind here. But um, what do you make of this? Is it a tension from your point of view or is it simply complementary? I, th I think it's, it, it's complementary in, in a way that uh, the, the modern moment that you refer to with the Flaneur and, and Baudelaire is, yeah. is about the individual account, being an eyewitness to events, seeing things for yourself. It's about dem democratization. Mm -hmm. It's about valuing relativity almost you know that everyone's response to something will be different and catching that fleetingness of the moment and i think that's what they see in holbein's portraits that they aren't generic like Ren reynolds for example ruskin says that there's grace and there's abstraction in reynolds portraits for holbein uh, ruskin sees him capturing a moment and the individual feelings of of the individual at that key snap as it were like a photograph almost like a selfie, I suppose, <laughs> you know, in the, in the one way that people take photographs of themselves when they're out and about doing things. Uh, what What's interesting about the Renaissance is that I think, I mean, uh, my understanding of the 19th century reception of the Renaissance in Britain is that it is something different for everyone um, who engages with the Renaissance. So it's actually closer to 20th century understandings of the Renaissance, that it's not the Renaissance, it's Renaissance is, you know, it's the famous text on, on the Renaissance um, by a German scholar 
um, kind of uh, kind of describes it. But it's it's account where, for example, uh, for the early nineteenth century, um, Raphael is the most important uh, yeah. Italian artist of the Renaissance. By the end of the century, it's Michelangelo. And th that transition from Raphael to Michelangelo is about personality, the individuality coming forward. And what we see in that transit is a move from an idea of the uomo universale that is actually an abstract idea to a uomo universale who is an individual, someone who embodies a specific take on that. And that kind of transition, I think, is nurtured by a liberalization of 19th century society and culture, where you know, people are writing for audiences who they're hoping that individual takes will be uh, made about what's being put in front of them on the pages of their art histories or on the canvases as well. So it's not about being didactic and saying this is what you need to understand from the Renaissance. It's about a learning process of self-betterment that, that middle class audiences want to engage in. But the Renaissance provides a a driver or a motor or an inspirational point for jumping off in a, a an experience of self discovery. I think, um, and and it's all kind of building upon the different themes and arguments that are being made about Holbein and Dura by different scholars. Um, that that kind of enriches that journey and gives people choices about what toolkit to use in their own personal discovery of Holbein or or Dura. Um, but I think that that modernness, it, you know, they, as Ruskin says, he sees it in Holbein's work more than Dura because it seems relaxed. It seems like a living room kind of interaction with a person, person from the past, whereas Dura is a little bit more formal, a bit more staid. And I think that, you know, I don't agree with Ruskin's judgments <laughs> in many ways, but I think that his observation of the depiction of the individuals and the difference between Dura and Holbein is probably a fair point and probably explains why Holbein was more popular in, in Victorian Britain. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question have a, from a, Eddie a Hughes. question from Edward Hughes. Um, shall I let, I'll let Edward speak? Yeah. Edward, go ahead. Mute. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Just a brief question, if I may. You, um, you structure your talk around consideration of art historians and then artists in the 19th century. How do you see that uh, separation itself working within the 19th century? You know, I'm thinking of someone like Ruskin, who, you know, was a slave professor of art, but who himself, you know, engaged in artistic practice. So how does the, is there a separate, sorry, is there, is it, are the categories porous or how do you see that? Thank you. That's a, a really good question, Edward. Um, essentially, the 19th century is oh, best known in terms of art historical scholarship of the modern period. So in the last 20, 30 years, people have been describing how professionalization impacted on the Victorian art world. You see that in art criticism. From the late 1860s, um, art critics become uh, specialists and they produce specialist art critical journals to write in. Whereas at the beginning of the 19th century, art criticism happens alongside literary criticism and other kind of interventions of a journalistic nature. Um, the same thing happens in terms of the invention of art history chairs. Uh, the Slade lectureship, for example, happens in the second half of the 19th century. There is no art history at universities at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, Semper lectures at UCL, um, but that's an innovation that happens midway through the 19th century as well. So art historians as scholars um, don't exist at the beginning of the 19th century, but at the end of the 19th century, they do exist. In the transition that happens between probably the 1840s and the 18, and about 1870, I'd say, there is a, a great porousness that exists between the different categories. I've explained with, or well, spoken today about, perhaps not explained, but given the example of William Bell Scott, you know, he is a, an art critic, he is an art theorist, he's an art writer, and he's an artist, right? And he had no problems entertaining all of those different capacities within his own professional activity. Um, and to the same extent, you've got art critics like Ruskin, um, becoming art professors. Um, so there's movement either way. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. That as well, you know. But I don't think they saw it as they didn't feel like they were handcuffed in any way. There was a freedom of of activity and intervention, and um, where they found all of their interests coalescing, as it were. Thanks very much. Thank you. In the German reception of the Renaissance towards the late 19th century, early 20th century, we have a shift, haven't we, from, um, to a certain extent, Dürer, much more towards Titian and Rembrandt. Uh, Rembrandt becomes um, rather suddenly um, a kind of focal point for um, what is then termed, for better or worse, the Rembrandt Deutsche. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a dreadful concept, and of course it was misused, as we all know. But um, we have no equivalent of that sort here, have we? This shift towards Rembrandt. I mean, you mentioned Michelangelo. It's of course a different, a different register. But um... yeah, I, d I don't, I don't think so. I mean, there's no. I mean, I think that everyone who engages with Holbein in Britain, mm. so uh, in a sense, to either acknowledge his role within British art history, but never to claim him wholly as a British artist because it wouldn't make any sense. You know, it, it's logical to, to limit the, the discussion from that point of view. But I think it's more of a, a discussion or expression of affinity that we're getting here, and not one that has any wider nationalistic agenda. It's just a coincidence, and one that is a, a, a jolly coincidence, you know, a, a happy coincidence rather than anything else. But I think it underlines that the people who talk about it um, often do have an internationalist kind of allegiance. So, you know, someone like Le Gros, he works in Britain, but he's interested in German art history and using German art examples to inform his own work. People like Monkhouse um, are producing and writing for journals like The Studio that brings together scholarship from across Europe. Um, it, they're open to a wider republic of letters that is not narrowly British from that perspective. So I think there's an underlying kind of values that are connected to it, but no overt agenda or activity that they all coalesce in uh, working together to try and produce. So it's slightly different from that perspective. Yes, yes. And harder I mean, to thanks. subvert as well, I think, probably. Yeah, yeah, that. Yes, indeed. I mean, the next step somehow would be, would it not, to see um, then the reception of Ruskin in Germany, which I think is also interesting, especially at the beginning of the 20th century, when we have uh, the young Hugo von Hofmannsthal, for example, in Austria, who is uh, a very keen uh, Ruskinian and, and tries to make the most of, of him. But this is for another lecture, I think. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, do we have any further questions, ladies and gentlemen? This does not seem to be the case. Yeah, well, no, um, no I think it is that. really up to me to thank you most warmly, um, Matthew Potter, for this fascinating talk. And um, of course, um, we might have the benefit of um, your text being turned into an article for uh, Angermion, which would be wonderful. So we could uh, re-digest, re-read what, what you have presented us with. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you and for listening. It was a pleasure. And thank you all for uh, attending. And I hope to see you all um, directly or indirectly before long at the very latest at our next lecture in the next uh, month. Thank you very much indeed and um, all the best to you all. Bye for now.